Coming up on KVIE Art Showcase, we celebrate women artists from around the world and right here at home. Meet a local designer creating timeless pieces. When I see people wear my designs, it's an amazing feeling. A lifelong traveler molds stories into art. Normally, the work starts from a real story, from a real person I met, from a real event. A champion for the arts finds a passion to create. We are all much more alike than we are different, and art tends to bring that out in individuals. A creative writer speaks out. How we see ourselves as being Hmong has changed, so it's really important for, I think, for myself to capture that. And art influencing art. The work that I do, a lot of it actually centers around stories that I make up or write. It's all up next on KVIE Art Showcase. It was way back in sixth grade that Sacramento designer Maisha Bahati started imitating the latest styles while adding her own personal flair. Before long, others were noticing. Now that name Maisha Bahati has become an established brand. What I feel it takes to make a successful career as a fashion designer, you have to have confidence. There's no ABC to being a fashion designer. Um, you definitely have to have confidence in your brand. And you have to be relatable. Gosh, my introduction to fashion uh, was more so just my style. I just like clothes and I like getting dressed. Um, so I always played around with different, different styles. I would uh, cut them up or I would try to imitate celebrities or, or you know singers that I liked. I just remember wearing it and I just had so much confidence because I, I learned how to sew when I was 26. I kind of decided, let me see what I can do. And I would just kind of do it for myself. I would either cut apart clothing in my closet or I would cut apart other people's clothing. And other people started to notice, hey, can you do that to my jacket? Hey, can you do that to my dress? And at that time I said, hey, I got something here. Let me see where I can go with this. The moment I realized this is in the right direction was probably when I did my first fashion show. I was asked to do a fashion show, you know, okay, I'll do it. Didn't really have any expectations from it. And after the show, I actually had um, a wife of an NBA player who requested to buy one of my pieces. When I see people wear my designs, it's an amazing feeling. I mean, that that's kind of, what motivates me. Um, when I design for someone, I design on how do I think they're gonna feel. So when I see someone in my clothing, it makes me feel good. It's the feeling others get when they feel amazing, when they feel beautiful, when they're getting compliments. I mean, there's no better feeling in the world than to walk out and feel like you look like a million bucks. The body's a work of art, so you put this, this amazing piece over it. I mean, you know, you have this, this Beautiful presentation. I definitely think my designs are artwork on the hanger. I mean, from my prints that I use, I use very eye-popping prints. I mean, just the prints alone are just artwork in themselves, very abstract. I love color. I love mixing color. I love long, kind of maxi-length dresses. And I believe women should go out and glamorous. You know, I'm a 70s child. So I try to bring that till now. Just like a painting, you're gonna see just stuff thrown together, but it just looks beautiful. And that's how my designs are. My silhouettes are somewhat simplistic. I don't do a lot of zippers or buttons, so I like to overpower it with color, with patterns. Just very comfortable clothes, beautifully draped. Flowy, I love flowiness. I like high split. A lot of times I don't even create patterns. I just, I have this in my mind. I don't sketch it. I see it in my mind. I drape it on my body and I just go. Every work is a piece of art. It is. It, it, it's different, whether it's the pattern, whether it's the material. It's always something different and how it drapes on the body. I've done fashion shows around Northern California. I've done a lot of fashion shoots that have taken me Africa, Europe, 
the East Coast. I mean, my designs have taken me worldwide. And it's very empowering to go from a homegrown grassroots. It's very inspiring. I mean, it's kind of hard to believe that I started from here and I'm all the way over here. You know, I still have a ways to go. My brand is timeless. My pieces are timeless. Anything I create is something that I would wear. Maisha Body is a name that you'll remember. I chose that because my name is pretty unique and that's who I am. And so my brand is basically me. It works. You know, I try to keep true to myself. So that's how I stay true to my brand is as I evolve as a person, my, my collection evolves. But it's always going to be my Shabbat. Wisconsin artist Christina Carfora uses her love of travel as her muse. One of the big inspirations behind my work is my travels. I've been to 23 countries. I've been working very realistically and life-size. We see someone we identify, we relate to them, and we hopefully are not just looking at you know what they're made out of, but actually their expression on their face. And so I'm using those clues and those identifiable, comfortable sorts of imagery to bring you into the narrative right away. My name is Christina Carfora. I'm a sculptural ceramics artist with a passion for drawing. Normally, the work starts from a real story, from a real person I met, from a real event, or something I actually experienced. A lot of times, it's just a moment or something that happens that flickers and I see something there. I do keep a, a sketchbook when I travel. I do a lot of photography as well. And so sometimes the beginning of a piece, I don't always see right away, but it's captured in a photograph. They're memories, and so how can you express that? through this sort of dreamlike quality. When I went one time in Kalimantan to a rescue, I met a female orangutan there who had her hand chopped off from an oil, the palm oil plantations. She was emaciated, starving, and she had been caught for quote unquote stealing from the palm oil plantation. So that piece, the orangutan, she has this mechanical hand that I created. She has like 300 different parts and I created all of the rivets and everything else, but I really wanted to spend a lot of time with this very harsh human element that I purposely made not functional for her. She can't use it, but it's a reminder always of this relationship and it can be beautiful and it can be ugly. The relationship between humans and how we're impacting the world and our environment. Normally with this, I actually put my own fingernail under their fingernails to make it convincing, so it's just like a real subtle. The hands, they actually represent a passenger pigeon. The passenger pigeon became extinct in 1914. Within only a few short decades, they went from over nine billion of these birds that flew in these flocks across the country, so dense that they actually would block out the sun. There were so many of them. They're beautiful, but they can also be destructive. The lace represents a time past. So I want to bring it to contemporary context and have us think about other issues. And so when they're installed, the shadows are actually the absence of the passenger pigeon. They're where the light is not. I really enjoy, and I think that's part of why I travel as well, is when I leave the realm of reality, when I re enter the impossible, and, and then starting to figure out how to communicate those sorts of ideas but I don't want to give you the whole answer. People can bring something of their own to the work and then take away a new idea or a story or a desire to travel somewhere, whether it be an actual location or something in their head. There's many different ways of traveling.
With a lifetime of dedication to sharing the arts throughout each and every community, Marcy Friedman has made an eye-catching move into the role of artist. Everything about my life is art-related. I do see everything through probably a bit of a studied lens now. It wasn't that way 30, 40 years ago. I didn't used to tell people that I was an artist. And I will tell you, it was a big surprise, but I think they're getting used to it now. My passion for life drawing had come from my college years at Stanford when I had taken life drawing classes and pretty much gave it up to be a, a mom, a wife. During that period of time, I got involved with the Crocker Art Museum and much of my energy, all my energies went into those three areas. What I found was um, when you're undergoing something that's stressful in your life, um, there is a bit of a therapeutic quality to art. It forces you to set aside the part of your brain that focuses on something painful and brings you into a realm where uh, you can develop new ideas. About five years ago, it was pretty clear that my husband Mort was suffering from a degenerative disease and it was weighing heavily on, um, on me watching this slow progression of the illness. And I knew I needed something and kind of in the back of my mind for a year or two I had been thinking, you know, maybe this is time to go back to the solace. The art form itself, the function of creativity I think it puts you in another zone. I think my art has become quite a bit stronger. I have really been focusing on looking more accurately at what I'm seeing. Can't walk the park or the block without seeing things differently. You know, if I'm in the park, I can see the changing seasons and the colors and you know, and in my head, I'm not just looking at orange, I'm looking at cadmium red orange. As we change, our tastes evolve, they change. You get, you know, introduced to something entirely new or different, whether it's been the development of the new Crocker, collecting, and these associations with the arts community. We are all much more alike than we are different, and art tends to bring that out in individuals. You can see that whatever walk of life you are, this appreciation for beauty is common, and I think that's what drives me. My goal as an artist, I guess recognition in some way. I'm not willing to stay at the same level. I just have this inner drive that every painting I do has to be better than the last one. Through spoken word, Hmong American writer Ka Va discusses the importance of keeping the Hmong culture alive in Minnesota. I am the extraordinary Hmong. Rice patty eyes, mouth full, open, filled with opium poppy seed. Hair long, black, like the Mekong. The ghost of my ancestor swimming on my back, waves breaking my spine, sinking like silver, clapping with the poetry of Gutierrez to the murky depths of my buttocks, sunburnt yellow buttocks, crisp by the McDonald eating sun as I slave beneath him. I'm not sushi, I'm not takeout, and I do not have an ancient secret. Pillsbury Doe people do not ask me for the Dalai Lama's number, because the monks from Shaolin Temple are revolting 
I don't know Jet Li, only Jet Lag. Will my spirit cross the ocean to be delivered to Toys R Us? But Hmong are not welcome in country clubs and corporations inside. Janitors, short order cooks, factory workers, please apply. Wax yourself on, wax yourself off. I already sound off. Don't Daniel sun me. I'm nobody's son. A nomad, sowing my seed, riding my fleece straight into your fortune cookie. Carrying more wisdom in my pocket than Plato's philosopher king. Driving down University Avenue, my future coming through the rear view. She riding steady on his steed, snapping drums, clinking gong, and an ancestor howl fills my ears with sounds of pride. It says, I'm the extraordinary mom. I knew that there was this desire inside of me to write a Hmong anthem, or at least my Hmong anthem, and I couldn't get the words out. And then one night, I was watching Late Night at the Apollo, um, and a young woman performed, a uh, phenomenal woman by Maya Angelou, and I thought, there you go. If Maya Angelou can say, I'm a phenomenal woman, then I can say, I'm an extraordinary Hmong. So I wrote Extraordinary Hmong in like 30 minutes, and I did some minor editing, but really, you know, when I say the ghosts of my ancestors swimming on ba my back, I really do feel in that moment when I was writing that the ghosts of my ancestors were on my back, helping me tell the story of our extraordinary existence. I get really inspired when I come to the Hmong market because it's a place for Hmong people to hold on to their culture and those things that are important like the food, the clothes that are being sold here. It's also a place for the larger Minnesota community, whether you're Hmong or not, to come and find out about the Hmong people. It was believed that once upon a time, the Hmong actually had a Rin tradition, but because of persecution from the Chinese, that they were no longer allowed to actually write the, in their language. So what they did was they took the traditional characters and they put it in the clothes. So this character is the eyes of a tiger. So this is the character for tiger. And you see another representation of the tiger eye right here too. I remember when I was a child, my parents dressing me up in a little dress like this and taking me to the Hmong New Year in downtown St. Paul at the River Center. It's so important as we become more Americanized to still hold on to our clothes, to still hold on to our stories, our folk tales, and our history. And that's not saying that we don't want to be less American, but it's just a piece of who we are that we should find valuable, that we should hold on to. This is a traditional skirt that has been made into a bag. Now, you know, the hipster in me says that is way cool, but the traditionalist in me says, this is meant to be a skirt. Why is it a bag? So things are forever changing um, in the Hmong community. And I see that change when I come here to the Hmong village. Um, and it's all good, it's all good change because, yeah, why can't we imagine something? For instance, why can't this skirt become a bag? And why can't our traditional folk tales become reimagined to include, you know, the landscape of Minnesota, the landscape of America, and different, some of those different ideas into our folk tales. And that's what I'm trying to do with my writing is to create stories that have familiar things in different landscapes. Being a storyteller, I think, is in my blood because I got that from my mom. She inspired me to tell stories. And, you know, I work in different mediums. I work in poetry, I work in essay writing, and also playwriting. And no matter what form or what genre I'm using, I feel that I'm always really just telling a story. And I think right now it is so important for us Hmong to remember our stories because how we see ourselves as being Hmong has changed. So it's really important for, I think for myself, to capture that, to capture what was, what is now, and what will be in the future of being Hmong. 
Florida-based artist Megan Nelson literally draws from her imagination. Her dragons and fairies transport her and each viewer to another world. Megan Nelson, illustrator for Poseidon's Eyes, was born in Palm Bay, Florida. She is now attending the University of Central Florida, majoring in English literature, which is her second artistic love. She also does freelance illustration and comic work when her schedule isn't a many-headed beast. Please congratulate artist Megan Nelson. Here I am standing on a stage in LA accepting a draw, uh, an award for drawing science fiction and fantasy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Winning Illustrators of the Future was really, really awesome because for a long time, what I said in my speech was that uh, my artwork had been stuck in a closet until that point, and that was true. So when I went to LA and I got professional illustrators telling me that my work is worth selling, it's worth being on display, it was just the validation, you can't explain it. It's like, what I do means something. I got started when my dad showed me how to draw a boy out of the word boy. So you draw a boy and then there'd be a head and eyes and everything. And after that I just kept drawing and then in fifth grade I drew a picture of a dragon for one of my teachers for a story I had written and my teacher went crazy about it. She's like, this is the best dragon I'd ever seen, this is really good. And I was like, wow, it actually looks pretty good, I'm going to keep doing this. So I kept on and I've been drawing ever since. I get inspired by looking at other people's art all over the place. It's just amazing what people can come up with and what they share. When I walk through art galleries and I look at other people's work, it's a connection, I feel. Because when I look at the work, I like to see like how it's made. I try to read how much work they put into it and the story of their artwork in the brush strokes. I love to do science fiction and fantasy art. I do dragons, fairies, people with magical powers. So interesting and so much fun for me to think about. Drawing dragons and drawing imaginary things, you sort of have to base yourself in reality. If I want to do a dragon, I'll look up pictures of lizards and snakes and give them the lizardy and snake feel. To make a mystical thing become sort of at least believable, you have to start in the basis of reality. And with creatures that don't even exist, you sort of have to make up your own anatomy and your own sort of history for what the creatures do, and I really like doing that as well. The work that I do, a lot of it actually centers around stories that I make up or write. There are characters that I make up and that I draw over and over again. Just stories are what sort of inspire the characters and what I have in my galleries and the work that I do. Animation has been my passion for a long time. Animation is something that's what got me into drawing in the first place, dragons on TV. Just having a character that you've made up or you've worked on and seeing them move around, it's, it's a feeling that I can't describe. It's something I really love. <laughs> I applied and was accepted to the Ringling College of Art and Design in their animation program, which only accepts about 60 students per year. But they sent me the bill and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't, I can't afford that. So I had to sort of reorganize my priorities, had to figure out what it was that I could do and support myself and if art was something that I could do to support myself. And I finally settled on doing art as a side thing as something that I want to grow up into and something that I will always work on, but I sort of teach myself artwork and go to school for the thing that will pay the bills. I'm a literature major and that's actually my second love. I love to write. Writing and art just, I don't know, they mesh for me because my art is inspired also by stories and my stories are inspired by art, so they sort of work hand in hand. Art is definitely a piece of 
I guess, humanity, you could say. Without it, I feel like we live in a pretty soulless world. You can look at a piece of art and you can see someone else's thought process in it. You can look outside of yourself and look into what they were thinking of. With science fiction and fantasy, you can see worlds that will never exist except in that person's head. Art's been with me for forever. I don't know who I would be without art. Being able to draw and express yourself is a really, really cool thing. Episodes of KVIE Art Showcase, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org video.